The title of my sermon is, Most Assuredly Will You. Most Assuredly Will You. We've been in a series all through this year. We've been going through the 25 statements where Jesus said, Most Assuredly. He's saying it in the strongest way he can possibly say in the ancient Hebrew or the ancient Aramaic when he said it. Um, these different things. <clears throat> and we're not going to go through all of them uh, this morning. But where we're at this morning, he's telling us this will be on the final exam. And he's asking us what we will do with the message that he's given us. Even though we're going to be in John chapter 13, it's kind of interesting. The majority of the book of John takes place in the last week of Jesus' life. And most specifically where we're at this morning, from 13 on, deals primarily with the last 24 hours of Jesus. Today, in chapter 13, we're going to be with Jesus, eating with His disciples at the Last Supper, the last opportunity He will have to spend time with them shortly after what we are going to read this morning. They are going to get up from the meal. They are going to leave. They're going to go down the side of the wall and out into the Garden of Gethsemane where He's going to be betrayed by Judas. These are His last moments with them. Where the other most assuredly statements have been in a crowd. And they've been in amongst the people. And they've been invitations for those who were lost to come to Him and trust in Him and learn from Him. This one is different. What were the four that we are going to read this morning are intimate and personal. They are not for the lost. They are for those that are following Jesus. And so, instead of just having in a normal sermon what you would have specifically from your pastor is a general thought that leads from introduction to conclusion. Because we're following Jesus words verse by verse, He covers four different topics that I want to cover this morning to challenge us, to ask us, most assuredly, will I personally. So let's go to our reading. Would you all stand with me as we read God's Word? John chapter 13, verses 1 through 11. As I said, Jesus is with His disciples. This is His last chance. He's giving opportunity for His servants to follow Him. But He's also giving them the opportunity at this meal that they would serve Him. At the beginning of a meal like this, they would have a servant that would come in and they would wash the dusty feet of those that were going to eat. They get to the meal, no, nothing is taking place. So at the meal, Jesus, seeing that no one has humbled themselves, puts the towel around himself, humbles himself, and uses, as a, uses the situation as a teaching opportunity. And he comes and he washes the disciples' feet. Verse 12, So when He had washed their feet, taken His garments and sat down, He said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call Me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, the strongest way he can say it, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. You may be seated. Verse 16 is our first most assuredly statement out of the four. Interesting situation surrounding it. How many of you have been to a foot washing service by raised hand? Actually, quite a few of you. That's pretty impressive. I didn't expect that high of a number, to be honest. Um, for those of you that haven't, start taking your shoes and socks off. We have the baptistry full already, so we're just going to take care of the issue. I remember my dad telling a story of something I think he was warning me from doing. But he knew of a pastor whose son was a little bit like I was. And they were going to have a foot washing service. 
And so he took his dad's socks and he poured black coal dust down the socks. So when they went to wash his dad's feet during service, they turned out black. Um, he didn't ever do that again, I might add. And I think the warning from my dad was enough that I was never going to do it either, if you know what I mean. I have been to a foot washing service, and it is a very humbling experience. But at least for me, it was not humbling how you would think of it. It was not, for me, to wash someone else's feet didn't bother me as bad as when my mentor David got down on his knees and washed my feet. I didn't feel right him washing my feet. <laughs> For one reason, I was a sports guy, you know. You play football, you get athlete's foot. I mean, it's just one of those things that happens. I hadn't had athlete's foot in 10 years. And maybe it was psychosomatic, I don't know. When they announced that we would have the foot washing service, my feet said, oh, you're getting it this week. I had the worst case of athlete's foot I've ever had, to the point that they were bleeding. And I begged David, I begged him, please don't wash my feet. I, I get it. You can do everybody else. Don't just, please, you don't have to put your hands on my feet. They're terrible. And he washed them anyway. It was very humbling for me. I felt like Peter. <laughs> Peter said, Lord, you're not washing my feet. And Jesus says, oh, if I'm not washing your feet, you don't have any part of me. And I love Peter's response. Peter was, well, if that's the case, get the bathtub out. I'm going all under. <laughs> From the bottom of my feet to the top of my head, Jesus, wash me all. And that's how I felt. Lord, David, please <laughs> don't wash my feet. You're too good of a man. Jesus should have never been the one on his knees serving Peter. Because Peter, in less than 24 hours, in fact, less than 12, is going to betray the one that washes his feet at least three times. He should have never been on his knees. Peter should have been begging to wash Jesus' feet, but he didn't. Worse yet, Jesus should have never washed Judas' feet. Not only was Judas going to betray him, but Judas was going to betray his very life. It's one thing to cast out and say, well, I don't know that guy. Curse and swear and say, yeah, that's not the guy I know. That's not me. That's one thing. But to say, oh, yeah, go ahead and take him. That's the one. Let me give him a kiss so you know who the one you want to arrest. That's a whole other ballgame. And Jesus got on his knees and washed Judas' feet too. Jesus, Jesus should have never been the one that was hanging from the cross. He never betrayed me. He's always kept His promise. He's the only one faithful. Through His entire life, through my entire life, through your entire life, He's the only one that's ever been faithful. Why is it that He was on the cross? He should have never been there. It should have been me. But I'm sure thankful that Jesus served and washed feet. And I'm also sure thankful that He was nailed to that cross for my sins. He served me. He served you because He loves us. As we sang, oh, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Jesus demonstrates here that no matter how low the master goes, he is always greater than the servant. No matter how humiliating the job, he is still the master. And he went to the lowest job of the low, the servant's job, and even though he was there in position, he wasn't there <laughs> in practicality. He was still the master. Jesus says, I want you to get it. A servant is not greater than his master. We get it backwards all the time. There's jobs that are beneath us. Are you kidding me? <laughs> if there was no job that was beneath Jesus, who are we saying that we are? If we're not greater than Jesus, and He went to the lowest job of the low, 
we should be begging him to scrub toilets with a toothbrush. We should be begging him to pick up the popcorn on the side of the street corner. The one, the only one that is pure and innocent and loving and merciful and gracious and faithful did the lowest job. We better be doing it as well. And we'd sure better be willing to do it. We should never have a problem in the church with cleaning toilets, sweeping floors, throwing away trash, washing dishes. But can I be honest? We pay somebody to do that because nobody's willing to lower themselves to that job. Am I preaching where we're at? If Jesus was willing to do the lowest job, why do you think you're better than Him saying that that's beneath you? I remember Ron McCormick, who was the district superintendent of East Tennessee when I was down there. And he was talking about when he was the pastor at Estill Springs, which ended up being one of the largest churches on that district. And he said he had to go into a board meeting to his board members and say, we need to make this a rule, and then we need to teach it. And the rule was, if you see it, pick it up. If it's not in the right place, move it. And his point was, if it's out of place and you know it, God's put it in front of you for you to take care of it, so you better do it. It's really sad that we have to make that as a rule in the church. Shouldn't we all be willing to say, Lord, I am thankful that I get to sweep floors for you and for your kingdom. I am thankful that I get to beautify your church. But that is not what we see, is it? It's awful quiet this morning. Aren't you all glad you came to church? Sorry, I'm just going verse by verse, so I can't. It's not like I'm trying to point people out. We have a pride issue, Jesus says. I don't know how many times I've heard it. Well, I've done that in the past. Somebody else can do it. I don't know how to do it. I've even heard I don't want to do it. But let's be honest. <laughs> I've been there too. Don't think I'm just preaching at you. I can tell you who you are, and I can tell you who I am. We aren't greater than the Master. And so we'd better be willing to do what he did and lower us lower than he ever went low. We are to willingly serve out of love for our fellow believers around us. We had better live there, folks. If Jesus was willing to, we ought to as well. Well, don't you all feel great? Verse 18. Skipping down a little ways. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Get that as a picture in your mind. Okay, they are, they are reclining at tables. It's not like you know the selfie that Leonardo da Vinci painted, all right? It's not a selfie. They were laying on a triclinium, if you want to call it the actual word, and they're laying down as they're eating. And what Jesus says is, as we're laying down here and we're sharing food, somebody gets up and he's about to stomp on me. Because that's what was about to happen. What a picture. Verse 19, Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am He. Here's our next most assuredly. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. You can read in the words. I mean, you can almost see it, how troubled Jesus is. He's, he, he's here and he's eating with his disciples and he's sharing his last moments with them. And it's almost like he goes to take a bite and he says, man, eating with me right now. Close relationship and friendship. I've just served you. I've just washed your feet. And there's somebody at this table that's about ready to stomp on me. You can hear his brokenness. 
But in the midst of that, he tries to tell them some important information. <laughs> I'm going to send you out as messengers. If people accept you, they accept me. If they accept me, then they're accepting the Holy Father as well. But <laughs> if they don't accept you, they're not accepting me. And in, ultimately, they're not accepting God the Father either. On Judgment Day at the final exam, when your whole life flashes before you eye, your eyes, even down to every secret word, you will be asked how you treated the, treated the messengers of God. God sends out people to give you information from Him. Are you listening? Are you rejecting? Yesterday I was at a board meeting in Mount Carmel. And it was rightly said in the discussion, folks, you know I don't agree with this, but if you voted in favor, majority rules, I will be gladly the first one to put the nail, nail or hit the nail into the board. Now, I didn't say it because, to be totally honest, he was opposed to my idea. <laughs> but he said it right. I don't have all the good information, all the perfect information. And sometimes I'm not correct and I'm not all there. I mean, I'm, I've got to be close, right? 99.9%, .9%, right? Our mindset should be messenger from God, information. I may not like the person, I may not like the presentation, and I may not even like the message, but you sure better be listening and testing the spirits to see if it's true. Because you might just be rejecting what God's trying to tell you. If God sent us a messenger, what do we do with him? We'd better be testing the spirits, folks. And I'll tell you what, there's sometimes a message comes from some pretty weird places. Not saying that they're all true. Not saying that you're going to like it. But you better check on it first. Think about this one. Imagine if the Virgin Mary or her betrothed husband, Joseph, would have heard Gabriel's voice and said, yeah, no thanks. I'm not listening. How about Zachariah? Because that's what he did, right? <laughs> and then the angel said, Buddy, you're not going to speak until John's born. He was in the temple when he did it. Can you imagine being in God's temple and telling him no? From a messenger that literally came from the throne room of God to your presence? Can you imagine what would have happened if Joshua would not have listened to the angel before the night of uh, the Battle of Jericho. They'd have been trying to scale the walls of Jericho and they'd have been obliterated. But God had a better plan. He listened to the messenger. He obeyed. If Gideon wouldn't have listened to the messenger, he'd have still been trying to hide food in the, in the press. He'd have still been hungry and been stolen from for years. The picture that you see there, that's me at the hill and fortress of Megiddo. It's overlooking the valley where King Ahab died. The day before King Ahab's demise. Prophets came in, a whole bunch of prophets, and they were saying, should we go out to battle? And all these prophets were saying, oh yes, go out to battle. You're going to win. We've got these horns and you're going to gouge out your enemies. It's going to be great. You're going to be victorious. And there was one guy named Micaiah that said, king, if you do it, you're going to die. Ahab says, man, I don't like him. He never speaks anything good for me. Problem was, he was speaking the truth. He threw him in jail and says, I'll be back for you. And he says, if you are, <laughs> I didn't get it right. So the next day, because he didn't listen to Micaiah, a random arrow shot by a random archer hit Ahab between the gaps of his armor. And he fell over it in a chariot looking like somewhat like that one <laughs> and bled out. And the dogs came and licked up his blood. He died there because he didn't listen to the messenger. 
There's another point that Jesus is trying to make here. He says, guys, just so you know, if I have a pers close personal friend who's willing to stomp on me, you can better expect it's going to happen to you too. We aren't too bad hurt by enemies when they come out against us because we kind of expect it. We kind of prepare for it that, yeah, they're coming after me. Okay, but they're my enemies. The ones that really get us and hurt us bad are the friends with the knife behind their back. Jesus says, if it happened to me, it's going to happen to you. If I've sent you out and they've done it to me, you're going to get it too. And in turn, that's, this is the scary part, in turn, ultimately, they're doing it to God the Father. Boy, I hate to have that on Judgment Day, wouldn't you? Hmm. Continuing further, we just read verse 20, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who, I, who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Like I said, Jesus is here at the meal. He's troubled. He's aching inside. And he tries to give them important information. And as he's saying it, as the words are coming out of his mouth, his grief just overtakes him. He's just, it's all over him. And so he says again, the strongest way he possibly can, one of you is going to betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore mentioned to him and to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Burdened with grief and pain, Jesus pauses in mid-thought and shocks everybody. He says, one of you at this table is going to betray me. And all of them are like, wait, who? What? Not me, Lord. It's got to be Him. <laughs> he was the one that first didn't wash feet. He was the one that didn't pick up the bread for the meal. Oh, He was... I love you, Lord. I'm going all the way with you. None of us, if Jesus said that, would believe it either. Right? If I was to ask all of us in here, if Jesus was to come in and ask, who of you is going to betray me? All of us would say, no, Lord, not me. But let's be honest. If we were really honest and we think back at our lives, the last time you really blew it, the last time you really messed things up, what was one of the first things out of your mouth? I don't know about you, but I know for me, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I went there. I can't believe I let it get out of control. All of us in here have done it. We've all fallen that short of the glory of God. We're just like Peter. We say, oh Lord, now I'm willing to die for you. And Jesus is like, buddy, you ain't going to make it out tonight. We never think that we are capable of doing something so heinous. But if we step back and we look at ourselves honestly, honestly, we will see if we allow ourselves to be let go. If we just take our hands off the wheel for one moment, we are too easily capable of doing anything. If we don't stop our eyes, if we don't shut our mouth, if we don't stop what we are doing, if we don't look out, Satan is at the door looking to pounce when we exit. You know... Peter and Judas, they had the same crime on the same night. You can call one worse than the other, but they were both despicable evil things. And the only difference between the two was Peter went out and repented. What's crazy is when you actually read through this in context, at the meal, everybody thought that it was Peter who was going to betray Jesus. Because Jesus said, buddy, you're not going to even make it out tonight before the rooster crows. You're going to deny me. They were all thinking it was him. They didn't even think of Judas. We all, we got to be awful careful because we're in the same boat. 
if we are not on our guard, the roaring lion is seeking who he may devour, and you're first on the menu. Verse 36. Simon Peter, after we've skipped down a few verses, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you shall follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay my, down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. I know that we would love to say, and I believe we would even as Peter did with conviction, Lord, we're going all the way and we're willing to die for you. But did Peter? Eventually. Yeah, eventually he was hung up on a cross upside down. But he wasn't there at this point. There was a lot of work that needed to be done in his art before he was ready to give up his life for Christ. We need to be really honest with ourselves and with God about who we are. We need to be careful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed what? Lest he fall. Now, I'm a guy, and I, at one time I was a teen who thought I could you know, take over the world. I was invincible. And on more occasions than I'd like to admit, I would do things thinking, oh, I'll be fine. <laughs> and I wasn't. Because I was thinking, oh, I'm safe. But I'm human. And I wasn't looking out. And I hit the dirt hard. I remember one time I was going to do long jump. And I was pretty good at long jump. I was going to break the school record. That morning... I was running the 400, the event right before the long jump. And I had worked myself out. I was tearing myself up to win that. And I did. I beat the record that year. There was like three of us, and I wasn't first, unfortunately, so my name's not up there. But I went to do long jump my senior year. And you put your foot on that pad, and you jump as high as you can. And as I did, <laughs> my hamstring said, oh, no, you don't, and snapped in half. And I went face first, knees into the dirt. Oh, it was bad. There's another event that we did, pole vault. You know how you do a pole vault? You, you run real hard, you stick it in the ground, you bend it, flex, and it shoots you up over the thing. Except the pole vault that I had didn't flex very well. And so I stuck that in the ground and I sent it up and I got straight up in the air about 10 feet in the air and nothing happened. And for what seemed like an eternity, but was actually only for a fraction of a second, I hung there like Wile E. Coyote and realized, oh, this is going to really hurt on the concrete. And boom, there I went. Be careful, he who thinks he stands, lest he fall. You're not invincible. And you're not perfect. And you're real weak. A lot weaker than you'd like to admit to everybody else. Be careful. Peter was shocked when he heard the rooster crow. Why should he have been? Didn't Jesus tell him those hours before? He was so convinced, he was so self-deceived that it took three betrayals and an alarm clock to wake him up to his own weakness. Lord, help us that we don't deceive ourselves so greatly. Those alarm clocks aren't any fun. Lord, help us to see our heart and scrutinize our actions so that we understand who we really are and not who we think we are. You ever had those conversations? I know a friend of mine that had this one last week saying, Lord, what's in the way between my relationship? What's in between us? And then the Lord gave information and he didn't like the information that he had. <laughs> you ever had that conversation with the Lord? Lord, who am I really? It's not an easy conversation. And I guarantee you, you're thinking you're better off than you really are. The title of my sermon today was Most Assuredly, Will You? I think from the passage, Christ is asking us as the readers to do some self-human, honest evaluation. 
Who are we really in the flesh that we live? Will you humble yourself as He did and serve out of love? Will you receive the messengers that He sent to you? Will you stay true to Him? And notice in verse 18 how Jesus said it to Peter. Will you lay down your life for my sake? Will you? I think that's the question for us too. Will you lay down your life for His sake? Matthew 16, 24-26 Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny Me. No, no, no. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross. Die and follow Me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for My sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Will you really lay down your life for My sake? One of these days, as I mentioned, we're going to stand before the final exam. Our entire life, every second, our greatest victories and our worst defeats are going to flash before our eyes. And in that moment, Jesus is going to ask, did you lay down your life for me? Now, I'm not talking about martyrdom. No, that's a whole other discussion. I'm talking about, are you willingly, daily, giving up your life for His will and the benefit of His kingdom? Don't misunderstand me either. I'm not talking about what you've done. The past is unchangeable and it's already marked down in eternity. If you failed back there, it's there. If you had victory back there, it's there. I'm not talking about what you did. I'm not talking about what you hope to do. The promises that you're making to God right now. Lord, I'm going to do better tomorrow. Let's be honest. Procrastination is a thing, right? And I dare say all of us use it a little too much. What I'm asking us is what are you doing today, currently in your life, to say, God, I'm putting your kingdom first in my life and I'm living my life to benefit your kingdom? not my own. Would you stand with me?
Amen. Amen. You are an answer prayer. This is for the healing of your God. You know, Dina had asked, I wasn't planning on singing, and, and God put it on my heart, and said, you know, it's before. Bless the house, bless the Lord, just let it be for your praise and joy. Let peace your heart. You know, work for me. I'm your vessel. Here, you know, here I am. I'm just what I said. And, you know, it was frustrating, but. Did that get me at the worst time? But yeah, God reminded me, you know, I was so lost. I mean, I wasn't going to get through it. My mama didn't raise me like that. And I so need to grace me for and so did to get my book. And God's forgiven me. He has forgiven me, and I would never do that again. And not only that, I'm just thankful that He touched your heart. Because I get judgmental, you know, we all do that. You know, at least I'm not like that person. I'm not living like that. They're doing this. They're living in sin. They're living. But, you know, one of my favorite scriptures that we all need to remember, I mean, I'm just paraphrasing. I think it's in the book of James. You know, says if we set the word the law was concerned, if we fell in one area, we sinned in everything. So I've been in God's eyes just because of one sin. I've been a whore. I've been a killer, I've been a murderer, I've been, you know, because that's all it took was that one sin. Yeah. And so when we go out there today, let's remember that, you know, let's don't look down on people. Let's, let's as the pastor talked about, you know, let's serve the Lord. Let's humble ourselves. Yeah. And so I'm thankful that he touched your heart. Amen. <laughs> that's right that's the truth that's the truth well let's pray shall we heavenly father we thank you for who you are and all that you have done on our behalf we worship you this morning. And as we have the look of you washing Judas' feet, we see us sitting there. And we want to say with Peter, Lord, don't wash our feet. This morning we cry out and we say, Lord, we want to be washing others. Please give us the opportunity to be a ministry and to humble ourselves before You and before those around us and love them and serve them out of love. The love that You have placed within us. We thank You for what You're doing in hearts. We know it's nothing that we do. We know it's nothing that we're worthy of. But it's what You are doing and we praise and glorify Your name this morning. As we go to leave this place, we ask, Lord, that You would help us to be a benefit to those that are around us, that we would serve them as You served us, that we might be Your ambassadors, that we might take Your light into a dark world and eradicate the darkness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, he may have already went back to get ready. Joseph? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon, and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.